Welcome to Descriptive Statistics and Data Visualization, a video lesson in probability and statistics. In order to get the most out of the frequentist interpretation of probability, it's necessary to develop some tools for analyzing data that typically leads to the frequentist computations of probability. And what follows, we'll look at a suite of computational and graphical tools for doing just that. We'll begin by introducing measures of central tendency. The values in many data sets exhibit a tendency to cluster around a central value. This phenomenon is known as central tendency and there are several measures for it. We define three below beginning with the mean. So if D equals X1 through Xn is a set of numerical observations, then the mean of this data set is defined to be its arithmetic average, which is computed by summing the numerical values and then dividing them that sum by the total number of values that are present. The second measure of central tendency we'll consider is the median. So if d equals x1 through xn is a set of numerical observations, then the median of this data set is defined to be the middle value and it's denoted by the symbol x tilde. That is, if the observations are arranged in increasing order, then the median of the data set is the value that separates the list of observations into two lists of equal size. If there's an even number of observations in the data set, then the median is just defined to be the mean of the two middle values that divide the list of observations into two lists of equal size. The final measure of central tendency that we'll consider is the mode. And we'll define the mode in two different ways depending on whether our data is discrete or continuous. So in the discrete case, if d equals x1 through xn is some set of discrete or integer observations, then the mode of this data set is just the observation that appears the greatest number of times. On the other hand, in the continuous case, if d is a set of continuous or perhaps real valued observations, then the mode must be estimated. And while there's a bunch of different ways that we can estimate the mode of a continuous data set, the simplest way is just to discre discretize the data. We'll divide the interval from the minimum data point to the maximum into some number, k, of equally sized bins. We define the mode to be any representative of the bin that has the largest number of data points in it. A typical way of choosing a representative is simply to compute the mean of the data points found inside of that bin, but there, there's other perfectly valid ways as well. We'll illustrate how to compute our measures of central tendency from their formulas with an example. In an experiment on sleep disorders, a scientist administers a new formula of sleeping medication to 35 test subjects and records how many of them sleep continuously for at least eight hours. The scientist replicates the experiment a total of 15 times with a different group of 35 test subjects each time. The counts recorded by the scientists are D equals 11, 9, 10, 12, 9, 15, 10, 7, 13, 16, 10, 4, 7, 9, and 11. The scientist finds that the mean of this data is simply the sum of all of the values in the data set divided by the total number of values in the data set, which is 15. This results in a value of the mean equal to 10.2. In order to compute the mode, the scientist first arranges the data in increasing order. She observes that the median number, x tilde equals 10, falls between the first seven and the last seven numbers of this data set. She also observes that the values 9 and 10 each appear three times in the data set and that all other values appear fewer times. Thus, both values play the role of modes. With three measures of central tendency in place, it's natural to ask the question, which measure do we use? The mean is one of the oldest and most used measures of central tendency. The mean has its advantages. It is well known even among non-specialists. It is quick and simple to compute the mean of a set of numbers, even with a calculator. Unfortunately, it has its disadvantages too. 
the mean can be fairly sensitive to statistical outliers or extreme values in a data set. The median and mode each have their own advantages and disadvantages. In terms of advantages, the median and the mode both are much less sensitive to outliers in the data set than the mean. However, they have the disadvantage of being much less well-known among non-specialists, and they are a little bit more complex to compute. If computing either the mode or the median by hand, sorting or searching through the data is required. In order to determine whether the mean, median, or mode is the best measure of central tendency for you to use, you just have to carefully weigh the different advantages and disadvantages of the three measures against your own particular needs that are tied to the data application that you're currently working on. Recall that the disadvantages of the mean and the advantages of both the mode and the median had to do with statistical outliers that might be found in a data set. To see how these advantages and disadvantages manifest themselves, let's recall the data set from our previous example. And that was a set of numbers D um, pictured here on our screen. The mean, the median, and the modes of this data set were 10.2, 10, and then 9 and 10, respectively. An outlier is just a numerical value in a data set that's either extremely large or extremely small in a way that's unexpected compared to the way the rest of the data seems to be behaving. So we can simulate that for this data set by imagining that the person who recorded the data set made an error in writing the last entry. Instead of 11, they recorded a value of 111, resulting in a data set that has this single outlier, 111, that seems oddly large compared to the remaining values. If we were to go through the exercise of recomputing the mean, the median, and the modes of this data set, we'd find that the mean comes out to a value of 16.8667, while the median is 10, and the mode is 9 and 10. So the median and the modes, they didn't change at all. The mean, on the other hand, changed significantly from its original value of 10.2. So this is what we mean when we say that a mean is somewhat sensitive to the influence of outliers, while the mode and the median tend to be more robust against that influence. So to review, after introducing an outlier to our data set, its mean changed substantially while the median and the modes didn't change at all. You should put some thought into what might be the numerical causes for this phenomena. In other words, why is the mean so sensitive to the influence of an outlier while that's typically not the case for a mode or a median? It is certainly important to be able to compute the various measures of central tendency. However, it's equally important to know what they mean and how they relate to the data they were computed from. One way to gain such an understanding is through the use of visualization. In particular, a histogram can lead some intuition about how these points of central tendency relate to their own data set. To create a histogram, perform the following steps. First, draw a set of horizontal and vertical axes. Then, along the horizontal axis, sketch a number line that contains the range of the data set. In other words, the number line should span at least the distance from the minimum value in the data set to its maximum value. This range can then be divided into subintervals. Usually, each of the subintervals will all have the same width, but this doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Over each subinterval, draw a vertical bar. The height of each bar, scaled along the vertical axis, equals the number of measurements from the data set that fall within the particular subinterval the bar is drawn over. If you were to follow the procedure that I've just described and apply it to the data set that has appeared in the past couple of examples we've looked at, then you should arrive at a figure that looks 
at least qualitatively similar to the one that's depicted on the screen now. Notice that the two modes of the data set, 9 and 10, appear right under the twin peaks of the histogram. So this is one feature of histograms that's particularly useful. The peaks line up with the modes of a data set. Now histograms can be drawn on graph paper by hand, but this can be rather tedious for large data sets, especially when they're not already sorted. Fortunately, some scientific calculators are capable of creating histograms, and most mathematical and statistical software accomplishes this task readily. In the technological companion for this video lesson, we'll learn how to use both MATLAB and the TI calculator to create histograms, other visualizations of data sets, and a whole array of different descriptive statistics. Measures of central tendency, such as the mean, the median, and the mode, aren't the only descriptive statistics that we might want to study in reference to some data set. When we make repeated measurements in order to collect data, there will often be some variability in the results. The notion of central tendency tells us where that data tends to cluster, but the notion of variability measures how tight or loose this clustering is. Variability provides us with a measure of how much dispersion around the point of central tendency we might observe. We will consider several measures of variability. These include variance, the standard deviation, range, quartiles, and interquartile range. We'll consider some measures of symmetry, including skewness and Bowley's measure of skewness. And then finally, we'll consider the importance of outliers, which is measured by a descriptive statistic we call kurtosis. We can measure the variability by computing the mean of the squares of the deviations of each value in the data set relative to the mean of that data set. The advantage of this approach is that it's straightforward. This measure will be large if many values in the set are far from the mean, such as what we'd see in a noisy data set, and it will be comparatively smaller for data sets with few values that stray from the mean. This approach also has some disadvantages. Primarily, this measure will not share the dimension of the data set. Its dimension will be the square of that of the data set. It's also sensitive to outliers much in the same way that the mean of a data set is sensitive to outliers. Regardless, we'll now define this measure of variability for what it is, and it's called the variance. If d equals x1 through xn is a set of numerical observations, then the variance of this data set is defined to be the mean of the squared deviations of the observations in the data set from their own mean. And it's computed directly using the formula displayed on the screen now. Recall that one of the disadvantages of the variance as a measure of variability is that it's not expressed in the same units as the data itself. In other words, it doesn't have the same dimension as the data. So, for instance, if the data was measured in feet, the variance of that data set would be measured in feet squared. We can overcome this disadvantage simply by computing another measure of variability as the square root of the variance. This results in a new measure of variability that shares the same dimension as the data set, and it's known as the standard deviation. We'll define it now. If d equals x1 through xn is a set of numerical observations, then the standard deviation of this data set is defined to be the root of the mean of the squared deviations of the observations from their mean. In other words, the standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. It is still worth being aware that, like the variance, the standard deviation of a data set is still sensitive to outliers that might exist within that data set. Outliers can be very problematic. We've already seen how the addition of even one outlier to a data set, if it is sufficiently far from the mean, can dramatically shift the original location of the mean. This effect also is apparent with variance and standard deviation. As a result, it would be advantageous to develop measures of variability that are less sensitive to outliers in the same way that the median and the mode are robust measures of central tendency. 
To get there, we'll define a few more descriptive statistics that are related to variability. Specifically, we'll define the range and the quartiles of a data set. So if d equals x1 through xn is a set of numerical observations, then the range of this data set is the difference between its maximum and minimum values. After arranging d by increasing value, the quartiles of the data set are the points that divide d into four smaller lists of equal size. The first quartile divides d between its lower quarter and upper three quarters. The second quarter is just the median of d. It divides the data set into two equal halves. And the third quartile divides d between its lower three quarters and upper quarter. If any of the quartiles are located between two data points rather than on one, they are calculated by finding the mean of those two data points. Having a definition for quartiles in place provides us with the ability to devise a robust descriptive statistic that measures variability. It's called the interquartile range. The interquartile range, or the difference between the third quartile and the first quartile, is a robust measure of variability. It represents the width of the interval occupied by the middle half of the data set. And like the standard deviation, it shares the same dimension as the data set that it is computed from. At this point, we've now seen several formulas for different measures of variability. To be clear, these measures are more complicated than the formula for just a mean or even a median. For this reason, we're going to delay illustrating these measures of variability, and for that matter, future measures of symmetry and the importance of outliers until we can get into the, compan the technological companion for this video lesson. It just is more practical to compute these measures of variability, symmetry, and the importance of outliers with the aid of technology such as a calculator or a mathematical software like MATLAB. It is possible for a data set to be asymmetric about its mean. What this means is that there are substantially more data points further to one side of the mean than the other. Such a data set is said to be asymmetric or to have non-zero skewness. So the skewness is a measure of asymmetry. We'll define skewness in the following way. If d equals x1 through xn is a set of numerical observations, then the skewness of the data set is typically denoted by the Greek letter gamma. And we define it using the formula that's displayed here. It is the mean of the sum of the cubes of the deviations of each data point from the mean of the data set, all divided by this, the cube of the standard deviation. So if gamma or skewness is positive, there's more data to the right of the mean than the left, and we say that the data set is right skewed. If gamma is negative, then there's more data to the left of the mean than the right, and we say that the data set is left skewed. Outliers in a data set can impact skewness in the same way that they impact the mean, variance, and standard deviation. For this reason, it is advantageous to introduce a robust measure of asymmetry just like it was a good idea for us to introduce robust measures of variability, such as the interquartile range, and central tendency, such as the median or the mode. One robust measure of asymmetry is Bowley's measure of skewness. And we define it in the following way. If d equals x1 through xn is a set of numerical observations, then Bowley's measure of skewness, or b, represented by the following formula, is a robust measure of asymmetry. It represents a ratio comparison of the difference of the mean of the first and third quartiles in the median relative to the interquartile range. Thus, if it is positive, the median is on the left side of the interquartile range, so the data set is right skewed. If it's negative, the median is on the right side of the interquartile range, so the data is left skewed. 
The final type of descriptive statistic that we're going to consider is one that measures the importance of outliers within a data set. So data sets with a large number of outliers are somewhat less common than those with few outliers. They can be a bit more problematic. If we're using that data set to draw conclusions about the system we collected it from, by applying a frequentist analysis for instance, a large number of outliers might diminish the reliability of those conclusions. It would be useful to have a tool capable of measuring how much data is located in the extremities of the data set. One common tool for doing this job is a descriptive statistic known as the kurtosis, and we define it in the following way. If d equals x1 through xn is a set of numerical observations, then the kurtosis of this data set is typically represented using the Greek letter kappa, and it's computed using the formula depicted on the screen. This formula represents the mean of the deviations of each data point from the mean and the data set, each raised to the fourth power, all divided by the fourth power of the standard deviation. A useful rule of thumb states that data sets with a kurtosis much larger than three are likely to have a lot of outliers. We'll see why this rule of thumb is true once we learn a little bit more about the normal probability distribution. Before moving on, we should give more consideration to visualization of our data now that we have additional descriptive statistics to work with. We should ask the question, do these statistics affect the look of our histogram? In the figure you see now, there are histograms of two data sets with equal means but unequal standard deviations. The histogram of the data set with the greater standard deviation has less amplitude and greater breadth than the histogram of the data set with the smaller standard deviation. Well, that addresses how variability affects the shape of a histogram, but we might ask what about symmetry? In the figure you see now, there are histograms of three data sets. The data set with the positive skewness has a right tail that is longer than its left tail. It is right skewed. The data set with the small skewness is nearly symmetric. Both tails have similar lengths. Finally, the data set with negative skewness has a left tail that is longer than its right tail. It is left skewed. Finally, now that we've addressed how both variability and symmetry affect the shape of a histogram, we can consider the importance of outliers and see how kurtosis plays a role. In the figure you see now, there are histograms with two data sets with similar means. However, one data set has more variability than the other, but not in the same way we saw when comparing standard deviations. The extra variability is in the data set's long tails. This data set has a much greater kurtosis than the other, even though their peaks have more or less the same width at their half height. In other words, if we visually compare two different data sets, with all other things being held equal, but one has a greater kurtosis than the other, the data set with the greater kurtosis is going to have comparatively longer and fatter tails. This behavior is exemplified by the orange histogram in our figure. In addition to using a histogram for understanding our data sets, it is worthwhile for us to introduce one more visualization tool. Histograms give some indication of both the central tendency and variability of a data set. The peak of the histogram, if there is one, should be near the various measures of central tendency, and steep and narrow histograms signify data sets with less variability than those that are short and wide. However, the box and whisker plot developed by John Tukey in 1966 provides us with an alternative way to visualize central tendency and variability. Box and whisker plots represent the range and quartiles of a data set in a very visual way. To create a box and whisker plot, we can follow a fairly short sequence of steps. First, compute the minimum and maximum values within the data set and the three quartiles. 
then draw a faint line parallel to a vertical axis that includes the range of the data set. Mark points along this line that are at the same elevation as the minimum, the first, second, and third quartiles, and the maximum. Draw a box through the faint vertical line with the top and bottom edges that pass through the first and third quartile marks. Then draw a horizontal line across the box and through the second quartile mark, or the median. And finally, draw dark lines from the top of the box to the maximum and the bottom edge of the box to the minimum. These are the whiskers. Box and whisker plot you're looking at now represents the data set from the sleep disorder examples. Some statisticians will identify the outliers in their data and then draw the whiskers so that they do not reach all the way to them. Instead, the outliers will be drawn as points or plus marks, and the whiskers will extend only to the next greatest and next smallest data points. Like we saw when we used histograms to visually compare data sets on the basis of their variability, skewness, and kurtosis, box and whisker plots can be used to uncover similar structure. In the figure we're looking at now, the first data set has a comparatively small variability. Both its interquartile region and its whiskers are small. The second data set has a comparatively larger variability. Both its interquartile region and its whiskers are large. We can use box and whisker plots to compare data sets on the basis of their asymmetry as well. In the figure displayed now, the first data set has a positive skewness. So there's a longer whisker above the interquartile region and the median is on the low end of the interquartile region. The second data set has nearly zero skewness. The median lies near the middle of the interquartile region and the whiskers are of similar lengths. The third data set has a negative skewness. There's a longer whisker below the interquartile region and the median is on the high end of the interquartile region. We can even use box and whisker plots to compare data sets on the basis of kurtosis. In the figure displayed now, the first data set has a much smaller kurtosis than the second data set. The box and whisker plot for the second data set is made up almost entirely of outliers. In this way, the box and whisker plot is a visual depiction of how kurtosis measures the importance of outliers. In less extreme comparisons, we'd simply see much longer whiskers and more outliers in the box and whisker plot for a high kurtosis data set. Well, that brings us to the end of this video lesson on descriptive statistics and data visualization. Thank you for watching. As I mentioned earlier, this video lesson was pretty light on computational examples uh, for how to compute the descriptive statistics from their formulas or how to draw the visualizations by hand. While it's certainly possible to do those things, it's just not very practical, especially when you're working with large data sets. So the next reasonable step in learning how to work with descriptive statistics computationally or learning how to visualize data sets would be to work through the technological companion for this video lesson. There's a link to it in the profile and I encourage you to follow that link next. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.